Welcome everyone to the Grind It Podcast. Nipsey Hussle is going to bring us in just a little bit with Grinding All My Life. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. It's time to hit this rail we call life and grind it. So we, we come to John 18, and it starts the mock trial, if you will, the, the so-called trial that the religious leaders had with the, the Roman authorities to get Jesus to be crucified. And what has happened up to this point is that Jesus has had a conversation with his 11 disciples that are left, because if you remember, he dipped the bread in the bowl with Judas, and he told Judas to go do uh, what he has to do and do it quickly. And the 11 men that are left in that room with Jesus on that night of the Passover, they're freaking out because Jesus has told them that one of them is a murderer, and, and it, which ends up being Judas. And he is telling them that he's about to die, that he's going to be leaving them. And this is a guy they have spent three to three and a half years with, and they have become, become really close. I mean, they've seen all these great things that Jesus has done for people and how he has shown compassion to people and helped so many people and done so many great things that they just can't wrap their head around the idea of him being gone, that somebody could actually kill him and, and him having to leave because they're thinking, hey, you are the Messiah and, and the Messiah is this great and mighty person. Why would the Messiah allow people to do this, do such a thing to him? But Jesus is trying to tell them, this has to take place. My death on the cross, it has to take place. I have to ascend back to my Father because when I send back to my Father, we will come back to you. My Father and I will come and we will live inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit and we're going to be with you always. And so in John 17, he prays on behalf of the disciples and he asks the Father to protect them because he tells them straight up, the world's going to hate you. It hated me and it's going to hate you because I'm living inside of you and they're seeing me work through you. They're going to hate you and you're going to be you're going to be persecuted. As a matter of fact, you're going to be killed for your faith. And so be ready is what he's trying to explain to them because he knows this is his last few hours to be with them and so he's just trying to prepare them the best that he can he, he even tells me he says i have so much more to tell you but i can't because you can't even process it yet this is too much for you to to be able to handle and so we come to john 18 and jesus and his disciples they they finish the discussion jesus says his amen on his prayer and they go on about their way and they cross the kindred valley uh, to uh, John says uh, uh, where some olive trees were, but we know it is called the, the Mount of Olives. And now John doesn't go into uh, detail like the other Gospels do. John just says, hey, he, he went to some olive trees and he's met by Judah, Judas and this militia. But if you read the other Gospel accounts, you'll see that, that, that Jesus spent a lot of time with his disciples, most of the night really, it, uh, in the, the Mount of Olives because he had asked his disciples on three different occasions to to pray with him. But, and, and Luke even tells us in Luke twenty two forty four that Jesus was in such agony that his, his, his he, he began to, uh, his sweat turned into blood from his, his forehead. And there's a condition that that's called and you can Google all that. It doesn't really matter uh, for us right now. But they kept falling asleep. And he would go wake him up and say, can't you just stay awake for a little while because this is about to happen to me and this is important that you watch and pray with me. But they would always just continue to fall asleep. Um, but John just says that, hey, Jesus shows up to this this uh, these olive trees with his disciples and he's met with Judas and this militia. And I want to point out two things about this militia that came with Judas. The first thing that John mentions is that this militia is made up of Roman soldiers and temple guards. And they were given to Judas by the leading priests and the Pharisees. And we all know who the Pharisees uh, were because, uh, you know, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea, who uh, got Jesus' body off the cross, and was, he was a Pharisee. But the Pharisees, they hated Jesus. Uh, they 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 were jealous of Jesus because they Jesus was still in the spotlight from them, 
And they, they just, they didn't like Jesus at all. And here they are thinking that they have the upper hand because they have paid this guy, one of Jesus' own disciples that Jesus handpicked. They have paid him off. They have given him uh, 30 pieces of silver and 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 Judas is going to lead them to where Jesus is going to be. And they uh, give Judas some soldiers to, to take with him to arrest Jesus. And so they think they have the upper hand. And if you think about it, it it's just it's it's kind of crazy that here are the people who were supposed to be pointing people to Jesus and showing Jesus and showing the example of God, and yet they are about to crucify God himself, God in the flesh. And the second thing I want to point out about this uh militia is when Judas arrived with the militia they arrived carrying all kinds of weapons they were carrying torches they're carrying lanterns and they're carrying weapons and this is trained soldiers who know how to use their weapons in a great way i mean these guys really meant business and and so i don't know how many was there 10 20 i don't know but these guys really meant business and here is jesus with 11 men. Maybe they were thinking there's going to be a, 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 a fight going on. And in, in, in matter of fact, Peter, as we'll see in just a minute, he, he tries to fight for Jesus because he, he takes his sword out of his sheath and he cuts off the ear of Malchus, uh, the high priest's slave. But if, if we were in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, this, in my opinion, this would be pretty intimidating for this militia to be coming with this man who is supposedly one of us. And he shows up with this militia who's carrying these weapons. And Jesus has never intimidated none the least. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when he sees the militia come, and Judas coming with the militia, he steps out. He steps forward away from the other 11 disciples. And he doesn't give them a chance to say one word. He does not give them the chance to say, we're looking for Jesus. Which one of you are Jesus? The militia show, shows up. Jesus steps out, showing courage at the very beginning. And he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says, I am he. And the moment that Jesus says, I am he, the, the power of God, the power of his spoken word. I mean, Jesus... He didn't say, God, take care of these people. He didn't say, men, take care of these people. Nothing like that. He's, all he said was, I am he. And, and when Jesus said, I'm he, or I'm the one you're looking for, the power of God came over these, these, this militia who thought they had the upper hand, who, who are trained with their weaponry, who have come with their weapons and their, and, and their, their torches, and they've showed up to arrest Jesus. You know, I'm pretty sure they thought they were going to be big and bad. They're going to be cocky. And, and when Jesus steps out and says, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. And Jesus says, I am he. The power of God knocked those guys down. They, I mean, knocked them down to the ground. And, and, and Jesus, it's almost like Jesus is kind of, making fun of them or, or, or mocking them in a way because he asked them a second time while they're there on the ground. He says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says, look, guys, I, I just told you I'm he. Why are you down here on the ground? You're supposed to be here to arrest me. I thought you had the power. I thought you had the upper hand. You're the one with the weapons. I have nothing. It's just me and, and my 11 men who do have weapons, as we see in just a minute. But Jesus says, I told you, I'm the one. Now, let these others go. And, you know, Peter, as I said a while ago, that Peter had taken out his sword and he had swung for Malchus. He's probably trying to cut off Malchus's head. Uh, but Malchus probably ducked out of the way or moved out of the way or whatever. And, and the sword caught his ear and cut his ear off. And in the other Gospels, Jesus takes uh, his ear or touches his ear and, and either a new ear grows or he puts the old one back on. But nonetheless, the guy, Malchus, he has an ear again because Jesus uh, heals his ear. And it, it seems like that Peter it, it is there to fight for Jesus and he's going to take care of Jesus and he's going to back Jesus. 
And, and, and he, you remember, because he said, I will never deny you, Jesus. I will die with you. I, I'll go to the cross with you. And, uh, uh, and Jesus had told him, he says, Peter, you're, you'll deny me three times for the rooster crows. And Peter says, there's no way that I, I would ever do that. But in just a few verses, it's like flipping a coin. Peter denies Jesus three times. And that's what uh, John points out in, in, this, in this chapter of John chapter 18. Um, during this time of being passed around, because it, 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 uh, he had gone, Jesus had gone from, uh, he had gone to the religious leaders because they had tied, the, the militia had tied Jesus up, which is kind of crazy because Jesus could have just thought a thought and made the ropes disappear or cut them loose or whatever. That, that rope had no authority, no power over Jesus but he allowed it to. And so they had tied Jesus up and they, the, this militia uh, leads Jesus to the, 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 the religious leaders, the chief priests, and then he goes before chief priests and then he goes to Caiaphas, the high priest, and then the high priest sends Jesus to uh, Pilate to be questioned. And during this time that, that he is being passed around, is is when the John kind of swaps to uh, Peter, and and Peter's denying of Jesus three times. The first time Peter denies Jesus. This is after he had just fought on Jesus' behalf. After he tried to cut Malchus's head off, probably, but he cut his ear off. And Jesus told him to put the sword back up. That that, that he has to do this. This is the Father's will. That he. He, he's going to be the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul says. He has to die for the sins of mankind. And so he tells Peter, he says, this has to happen. This is my father's will. So let it happen. And, and so as Jesus is being passed around on this mock trial, John tells us that Peter was, uh, he couldn't get inside the gate. And the lady who was in control of the gate, letting people in, uh, he, he, she had let one of the disciples go into uh, the court area. And, and so he comes back and asks for Peter's permission to get in. And she says, hey, aren't you one of those disciples? And, and, and Peter says, oh, no, I'm not one of those disciples. And then he's warming himself by the fire, and, which tells us that it's cold outside during the, Jesus' crucifixion. And when he's warming himself by the fire, one of the people there at the fire asks him, aren't you one of his disciples? And again, Peter denies that he, he doesn't know Jesus, that he's not one of the disciples. And then the third man, who was a part of the actual militia that came and arrested Jesus, he sees Peter and he says, hey, didn't I see you out there in the Mount of Olives when we came to arrest Jesus? What, weren't you there? And the third time, Peter says, no, I, I was not there. I, I don't know the man and the rooster crows. Now, in the other gospel accounts, it says that Peter was so defiant that he was not one of the disciples, that he did not know Jesus, that he began cussing. I tell you, I don't boop, 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 boop. I don't know the boop, boop, I don't know the man. He you know he had to be bleeped out, if you will, because he 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 just he he got belligerent, he got angry, he he got upset. I don't know the man. And the rooster crowed. Now, Jesus or Peter was when he had, when he had said because Jesus says, "Who do men say that I am?" And Peter was the one who stood up and says, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. You are the Messiah." And Jesus says, "Upon this rock I will build my church." Well, that that word "rock" mean is the word "petra," which means an immovable stone. Not not the '70s Christian rock band, but an immovable stone. You are petra, and Jesus says. Peter, you are Petros. You are a piece of this immovable stone. You are a fragment of this stone. You are a piece of me, if you will. So here's this man who is outspoken for Jesus. He's fought for Jesus. He, he says, I will die with you. I will never deny you, Jesus. And yet here he is denying Jesus three times. When we come back from break, I want to share a, a, a point from Peter, this Peace of the rock, denying Jesus. We'll be right back.
My name is Dinah Grace Hawk, and I started a movement of empowerment. I focus on Revelation 12:11, which states that we will overcome, conquer, and defeat him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we will not love our own lives, even unto death. See, sharing testimony squashes pride. It empowers, it strengthens, it encourages, and it heals. This whole movement is focused on sharing our testimony, our walk with the Lord, how He's using us in this life to empower others to do the same. By doing this, we will overcome anything that this world can throw at us because we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Every week from now till the end of the year, I'll be highlighting a different woman in the ministry and they're going to share their testimony. Tune in every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern, either on Facebook or Instagram at Dinah Grace Hawk. And you get to be a part of this movement, too. I'll see you there. So here's this strong man of faith, if you will, who has stood out for Jesus, just putting himself out there for Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And he has he tried to fight for Jesus. He 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 cut off Malchus's ear. Probably was going for his head, and Malchus ducked the sword or whatever, and, and just having to cut off his ear. And Jesus healed him. But here is this great pillar of faith, if you will, who fell in a in a flip of a coin, in a blink of an eye. Peter, this pillar of faith, denied Jesus three times, and and got so angry and so belligerent over it that he didn't know Jesus. I don't know the man that he began to cuss. He was so angry and mad. This great pillar of faith flip-flopped in a blink of an eye and and denied Jesus three times. We, We can very easily do the same thing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, he says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think you're standing strong, if you think you are strong in the faith, if you think you are just some strong pillar of faith, be careful not to fall. He says the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. So we will be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted by Satan. And how did he defeat Satan? By using the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. Three times. Jesus was tempted and Jesus overcome the temptation by using the word of God. It is written. But the, my point is, temptations come even against the strongest of Christians. And they are able to fall. They're able to give in because what the, what Satan does, he I don't know if you remember the cartoon or not, where they would dangle the carrot out. It was a Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny cartoon, I believe, and they would dangle the carrot out in front of the animal, and they, he would just take off running. And that Satan knows what he's doing. Satan is, is very strong. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, to just... Not just bite, but to devour, just overtake and, and kill and eat. And Satan knows what he's doing. He, he, he's very crafty, the Bible says. He, 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 he's very smart. He, he knows Scripture and he knows how to twist Scripture. And he knows our weaknesses and he knows how to use our weaknesses against us. And so he's not going to tempt us with something we don't care anything about. He's going to tempt us with, with this, something that's very close and, and dear to our hearts. Something, the, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Those things that, that catches our eyes. I mean, when, 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 when Adam and Eve were in the garden, when Eve, uh, before Eve ate that fruit, she didn't think anything about that fruit. She knew that God told them to stay away from that tree and not to partake of its fruit. And so they didn't. But then Satan comes along and says... Hey, what about that tree that, that, that God told you you couldn't eat of? See, he, he, he got her attention to focus on the one thing that they can't have. And the Bible says when she saw that it was good, she saw with her eyes. And then she reached out and because she had focused on this tree and she had focused on this fruit and she saw that it was good. And so she reached out and grabbed one off the tree and ate it. And pat, not only did she eat it, but she passed it on to 
her husband Adam and he ate. So they they both sinned. And 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 that's Satan is very smart and and, and he is very strong. I mean, we know our God is stronger, but He's going to use things that we're familiar with, the things that catch our attention, that catch our eyes, to tempt us. And yes, Paul says that, that God makes a way of escape, but, but sometimes it's just not that easy. Because temptation, sin is fun. And, 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 and when it gets our attention, and if we dabble in it too long, it, it, we become caught in its web and we're drawn in. And the next thing you know, we have sinned. And so in, uh, in verses 6 through 8, uh, it says, These things happen as a warning to us so that we would not care for the evil things that they did or worship idols as some did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrate with feasting and drinking and indulging in pagan revelry. We must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that the strongest of Christians who were following the cloud by day and the fire by night, they were following God. They, they, they were listening to God and following, following His lead. They fell because they got their eyes off of Jesus or off of the cloud, off of God. And, or off the fire, and they started to do fleshly things, and they fell. They died, as a matter of fact. And so Paul says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful that you don't fall. When temptation comes our way, like I said, God gives a way of escape, but if we're not careful, that temptation, it, it, it's just like a, a, a fish hook with a worm on it. You know, the temptation of that fish is to go and, and, and bite that, that, that lure that we use. You know, if it's an artificial lure. Uh, I remember one time a, a friend of mine and myself, we were down in Alabama and we found this pond. And it, I don't know if it was uh, uh, they fed the fish on a daily basis or whatever. I don't know. But these catfish were ginormous. And we were using a bass bait, and, and uh, we had uh, put that out in the water and caught one of these catfish. And these, I mean, they were just, they were huge, I probably 15, 20 pounds a piece. And, um, and th that's what Satan, it's a temptation because we, we, you know, we're tricking the fish into biting that artificial bait. And that's exactly what Satan does to us. I mean, he, he throws it out there and, and, and it jiggles and it, and it and it's shiny or, or it's spinning and it's making a certain noise and it catches the fish's attention. And the next thing you know, the fish is like, ooh, look, there's food. I got to have it. And the next thing you know, the hook's in his mouth and he's brought up and he's, and he's, he's dinner on our table. And and when Satan, he'll throw out this temptation to us and it, and it jiggles a certain way or it wiggles a certain way or or it looks a certain way and it, or it makes a certain sound. And the next thing you know, we're like, ooh, look. That thing looks pretty appetizing. It's pleasing to my flesh. I think I'll, I'll go. I'll go try it out. And next thing you know, boom, we're hooked, and we're we're being devoured by Satan. We become dinner on his plate. And so we have to be careful. It, they, just like Peter, one of the strongest of the disciples, denied Jesus three times, even though he said, "I will never deny you. I will die with you." He denied Jesus three times. So stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone that he can devour. And so God gives us a way of escape. But make sure we take advantage of that escape because temptation will come. And if we don't use the way of escape, and, and what I found out in my Christian walk, the easiest way to escape is to say no. But like I said, that's not always the easiest thing. So now I want to come back to these religious leaders. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the militia and their weaponry and how they came out and they, to arrest Jesus. Uh, I want to come back to these religious leaders uh, that had put Jesus on trial, if you want to call it a trial, and they sent him uh, to Pilate to be crucified. In John 18, 28 and 29, it says, Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended early hours of the morning, and he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. Uh, which would be Pilate. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? Now, 
get this. Here are the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the high priests, these religious leaders who have sent Jesus before Pilate, but they themselves would not go into Pilate's headquarters because they didn't want to be defiled, because they wanted to be able to take of Passover. Now, that is just ironic to me because here they are taking a perfect Lamb of God and they are going to kill God in the flesh. But yet they themselves didn't want to go into Pilate's headquarters because uh, they would be considered unclean. And they would not, since it was time for the Passover, if they were considered unclean, then they wouldn't be able to take a the Passover. And so they didn't want to go into Pilate's headquarters to keep themselves clean before God. But yet here they are taking God himself and having him crucified. They, they, they have cast God into Pilate's headquarters to be questioned by Pilate, and he's fixing to be uh, beaten and put on a cross. But yet they themselves, they didn't want to defile themselves before God, so they didn't go in. It's just, it's, it's crazy to think about. And so here's Jesus. He's before Pilate. And Pilate begins to question Jesus. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replies, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? And Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own people and your leading priests brought you to me for this trial. I mean, wow, what have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers wouldn't fight, would fight for me, which Peter tried. And he said they would fight for me to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And so Pilate says, are you a king then? And Jesus responded. He says, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And Pilate asked the magical question, I guess. What is truth? What a great question that Pilate asked Jesus. What is truth? And the answer is standing right before his very eyes. Because Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. But Jesus says, I am the truth. When Jesus was praying to the Father in John 17 that we covered in the last two podcasts, he says in verse 17 and through 19, he says, Father, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. Jesus says, your word, Father, is truth. What does John call Jesus? In John 1, he says, And the Word became flesh, the Logos, the Word of God became flesh. Jesus, I am truth. Jesus is truth. And here is Jesus standing before Pilate, who really has no authority over Jesus, but he thinks he does. And he says, What is truth? If I if I'd have been Jesus, I'd been saying, Dude, I am truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. You don't want to come into my kingdom? You got to come through me. You have no power over me. You have no authority over me. I am truth. That's what truth is. The, my Father's words. My Father's words is what truth is. But Jesus doesn't say that. He just allows the Father's will to be done, and he is about to uh, be handed over to be crucified uh, because as as this chapter ends, uh, Pilate goes before the crowd and he says, I have a custom that I can release a prisoner. Should I release Barabbas, who is a bona fide prisoner, who is a criminal, or should I uh, 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 send out Jesus and let Jesus go? And they yell for Barabbas. We want Barabbas. We want Jesus to be crucified because they have been coached by the Pharisees who are supposed to be pointing the way to God and these religious leaders on what to say. We want Jesus crucified. And, and the thing is, you know, 
obviously the Bible doesn't say, and and this was 2,000 years ago, so I wasn't there, you weren't there, but I just wonder if the some of the people that are in this crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him, are some of the same people who when Jesus, just a few days before, came riding in on that uh, into Jerusalem on that donkey and they were laying their their garments down for the donkey to walk on and they had the palm branches and they were they were crying out hosanna hosanna blessed is the son of david blessed he who come in the name of the lord i just wonder if some of these people who are now yelling crucifying were some of the people who were laying out their coats and their garments and and waving the palm branches and yelling at the messiah because he is coming in the name of the lord and now they're saying just a few days later, crucify, crucify. You see, it's just like Peter. Peter being so solid in his faith, I will never deny you, I will, I will die with you. But yet, in a blink of an eye, in the flip of a coin, and just two or three verses later, he's denying Jesus three times. Beloved, what I want to just challenge you with at the end of this podcast is just like what Paul says. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Don't think that you're so strong in the faith that Satan can't get to you. And I I hope you are strong in the faith. And I pray that you are. And I know that God is with us. But but the facts are that the devil is very strong. He is very smart. And he is coming after God's people. Look at our, look around in our society today. Look what's going on in our world today in these United States. Just look what's going on around you. Uh, it's obvious that the devil knows his time is nearing, and he is he is ramping up what he is doing. He he he, he is dangling the carrot, if you will. He he is making things shiny. He is think, making things more noisy, and he is trying to get our focus off of God, off of Jesus. And to focus on the things that are going on around us. And if we're not careful, we'll take the hook. We'll take the bait. And the next thing you know, his hook will be in our mouth. And we'll be supper on his table. Take heed lest you fall, because it can happen. I pray for God's hedge protection, just like he had around Job, to be around you. And I pray that your faith grows stronger and stronger each and every day. And when temptation does come, that you take the way of escape, that you are able to say no, and 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 that you can help someone who is also being uh, challenged in their faith, who are being tempted. Share Jesus with them. Pray on their behalf. And if you can help in any kind of way, go to that brother or sister and help them out of love to, to, to beat that temptation and to say no, because God has made a way of escape. Run to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Grind It Podcast today. You can send any questions or comments to grinditpodcast at gmail.com. Please join us next time. And when a challenge comes your way, just my, grind it. Been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle paid the price. Want a slice. Got to roll the dice. That's why all my life. I've been grinding all my life. Look, all my life.